Our next two panels are, are both going to look uh, at the question of emerging research and, and you know, it's, e it's easy to look back at what's been done or what we know is about to happen, but this is an, a chance to sort of explore in the context of, of the rapid change we've been talking about and recognition of what it means to decision makers and people on the ground. Um, it's useful to say, well, what, what's not in the, what's kind of in the pipeline but not uh, happening yet in research. So here to start off that first panel is Betsy Baker. Betsy is the executive director of the North Pacific Research Board, uh, and she is uh, a sterling member of the Search Science Steering Committee, and she'll introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Good morning. So we have a change in our panel listing, um, from the panel listing, and so I'm going to introduce someone who's not here, um, but I would like to start by introducing the panelists who are here. Um, Stacy Rasmus was not able to join us, and Rosemary Otongaro stepped in at the very last minute um, very willingly, and we appreciate her being here. She is a longtime community health aide in Alaska North Slope communities and a former subsistence advisory board member, former mayor, council member, tribal council member, and school advisory council member, and Nixet. So she has a lot of experience in many different roles. She has a lot of experience advocating um, and is concerned with health effects on communities of development, and we will explore that a bit more. So thank you, Rosemary, for being here. Uh, Gary Gernart, um, you have his bio, so I will simply introduce him as being affiliated with the U.S. Department of Energy, um, and he is closely involved in their climate modeling work, among others. And Hayo Eichen is at the International Arctic Research Center, University of Alaska, Fairbanks, but please refer to their bios. Minnick Rosing, I will read his bio. Um, he will not be joining us. He had a long field season in Greenland. He is the uh, professor of geology at the University of Copenhagen and a chairman of the board of Illus Matsutsarik, University of Greenland. A native Greenlander, he has focused on geology of Greenland, particularly on the emergence of life on Earth and how it has shaped the Earth we live on today. And I will be making um, more reference to his work as we talk about emerging research questions. Thank you. Thank so I'm going you to all. start with Rosemary. Thank and, you all. Um, yes, thank you all for the welcome. So you have focused intently on raising awareness and advocating for finding solutions to health and social impacts of hydrocarbon and other resource development on the North Slope, on communities and on individuals. So given all of those experiences that I listed earlier, um, what emerging research questions do you see as the most important for the people you work with? I want to thank everyone for the chance to be here and to share this opportunity. Um, it's important to bring our voices into this process and to help to expand the volume of our concerns. Uh, we have a lot of expertise with the generations of knowledge that we bring into this and engaging with others who are guiding decisions that are affecting us in the Arctic are so very important. Um, if it wasn't for my mom being one of the first uh, people in my family who were a person that was uh, tested upon by the military, I probably wouldn't be as strong in this process. But as a child, uh, she was one of the iodine uh, experimental victims. And uh, when our municipal government went through the process to look at that compensation, she was excluded because she was in a different protocol than what was compensated. So when we look at these kinds of things, it's really important to look at our communities and do it as a holistic factor instead of a, a part of the process. So for me, it's about looking at the health and wellness about our communities. So I 
um, as a community health aide, even if we live in our small communities, my village is only 500, we can contribute to these important discussions by what we bring into these discussions. Um, for me, um, watching the changes in our lands and waters, I saw the changes in our people. And respiratory illness is one of my big concerns because uh, when I started as a health aide, only one person used an inhaler. But by the time I stopped working in the clinic, there were already 75 people. But we were dealing with oil and gas development and the increasing activity coming closer to my village, the increased concentration of those activities. All of the studies were being done about numbers of caribou, not what's happening to the health of the people in our lands and waters. So by uh, asking questions at our local community meetings, I've been engaged in so many different ways that I would have never knocked on these doors because it's important to try to find the answers to these questions and break them out of these silos that are keeping them from uh, giving the tools and the resources to affect good decisions on these processes, not project approval. So for me, knowing what our risks are, and not just at a community level risk, but at a tribal level risk. The understanding of the risks as our tribal people are very different than some of these studies that are being put together to look at communities. Uh, when you look at how we use our lands and waters, you can affect the way that you interpret these various results that are coming into this process. So um, making sure that we understand things in a way, but it needs to be done in a precautious process, so knowing what our risks are and preparing to respond to them, but also in a preventative process. So if we're setting up the monitoring to know what our risks are and we're affecting these data, it doesn't do us any good if we're taking decades of data if we're not changing the decisions on the grounds and waters where people are getting sick. And so by uh, tying these processes into the reactions to the permit process in my area that are changing my lands and waters are very important to connect to these decision-making processes. But also looking at this process in a protective manner so that if we are getting data sets that are in exceedance of what others consider as acceptable levels, that there's a reaction to the process and we stop instead of allowing more emissions to continue to affect these important people who are suffering through these changes. Because all of us can bring important discussions to these issues. We may have to understand terminology in a different way but the vitality of our communities are important to engage in these discussions. I uh, it, know it's important to know about the animals in our areas, the animals that we depend upon to feed our families, and not just the icon species that they look at for tourism or other uh, revenue factors. These important things are important to know the wholeness of what affects these important food sources for our communities, not just that we have thousands of caribous that move across the North Slope. We also have to look at the changes in these animals as they move over time, but allow this to look at them over periods of time, not just clump layers and layers of caribou migration movement into a map so you have these thousands of transects of marks that go out it but no real understanding on how the caribou are changing as they move through these important areas and how it affects whether or not our communities are getting these foods that are important for sustaining our villages it's important to know how we use our foods because some of you may not eat all the parts of the animals but yet we know with scientific data that some of these parts of our animals are at higher risk for contaminants. So we need to know about these important discussions so that when we talk to our pregnant women and our children, we might make recommendations that, well, you're pregnant now, we would like to discourage you from eating the liver because it concentrates these contaminants, but we don't want to discourage you from eating the fish in a whole. These important discussions, can affect the way that you understand the data because 
narrow times of when we consume our foods can greatly change the interpretation of what our risk factors are. Can I ask you about the risk factors, right? So these are things that Gary also thinks about. And um, you've also raised issues of we can accumulate all of this data, but how can it help inform what actions are taken, what policymakers need to do? So I think we'll have Gary talk a bit about risk and modeling, and um, Hayo will then just a few introductory comments, but you raise a lot of the key issues that we want to return to. So um, I'm going to ask Gary, as, so you direct the Climate and Environment Sciences Division at a major U.S. agency, so the policymaker on the panel from the Department of Energy. And as we prepared for today, you focused us on the need for planning. So knowledge and planning were the two keys that the panel came up with as, as to what we need to think about new questions. And you've also noted that Arctic change will continue for 10 to 20 years regardless of policy action, um, which highlights the critical importance of that planning and that the largest uncertainties for planners relate to predictions, which we've heard a lot about here the last few days. So linking predictions and risk, um, tell us how emerging research can help planners better understand what the predictions can and cannot do. Okay, is this, this is on, good. Everybody, you should know that we're trying to coordinate these mics to make them work right. So thank you for the question, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be up here. I thought I'd make a first note and say that all of us up here on this panel and a lot of us have some personal connection to the Arctic. So it's based on the personal connection that we have developed a love for the Arctic, its beauty, its cultures, and we also have some interest to see how can the science that we invest in make a difference. And Betsy kind of ask the right question, and that is, in, in terms of making investments in infrastructure or other social systems, how do we use the science in the best way to inform the investment and the timing of those investments? So I work at Department of Energy, and the big focus which we have in my division is the development of prediction uh, tools and developing the science based on how we can extend so that these tools can be uh, used to support the right thing. And for those of you who are, have some connection to the finance sector or to the invest, investment sector, sector, these decisions are often based upon some level of uh, confidence in the predictions. In other words, how much uncertainty can we, uh, can we state from that we expect that these uh, that the future might un unfold. So in terms of uh, the simple models that have been developed over the past 10 years, they've often been very coarse grid. They talk about 100 kilometer resolution predictions. They try to tackle things like extreme events, which we see today are problems. But the challenge is how do we move these models to become more robust, higher resolution, more confident in the kind of predictions they make? And how can we use them in the right way? So within Department of Energy, we have some investments to focus on model, invest, model development and how we can exercise these models to demonstrate their capabilities. They rely upon uh, improved physics, improved computing, uh, much better data. And at the moment I say data, I'm going to reinforce a few points made yesterday or the day before, and that is that the Arctic is one of the regions of the planet which has probably the least amount of data. And ironically, it's the part of the planet which is changing the fastest. When I joined DOE about nine years ago, uh, the Arctic was a, it had a personal touch for me anyway because of a connection, but it was also apparent that the adaptive capacity in the Arctic or anywhere starts to become an issue if the global change or climate change is starting to exceed what that capacity is. And that was already happening a decade ago. It's just getting worse. And what that implies is that we have, we have to develop an aggressive schedule to figure out what the future might look like. And I recognize that this conference is 2050, where, so we're thinking three decades out into the future and how it could unfold over the next, next three decades. 
But the key thing is that we know that the, that the climate is going to be changing over the next one or two decades, regardless of policy action. As we start to initiate or institutionalize policy action, even now, it's going to make a difference more two decades out and beyond than in the, over the next few years. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference over the next decade if there is an emission reduction strategy or not. But it makes a huge difference as you get out beyond two decades or three decades. And that has an important component to how we do infrastructure or other type of social system planning. I know a lot of us here who have looked at the infrastructure issues, we often think about uh, public bonds. I mean, these are the finance instruments, typically 30 years, ironically, that's on the 2050 time scale. But the key thing is, as the global changes start to play out, we really don't understand what that means in terms of the rates of permafrost thaw, how the changing on an interannual basis and what those feedbacks might be on ocean circulation or fisheries. Extreme events are starting to play out. I would say a decade ago, we didn't think so much about wildfires emerging in the Arctic like they are today. And all we're going to imagine is that these are not going to get better in the future. And so the question is, how can we get, come up with some more robust projections of what we might experience and start to incorporate these with some acceptable level of uncertainty so that stakeholders can use this information in an effective way. So that's the connection to the planning process. So um, my last comment, because I realize we have to move on here, is that DOE has a huge investment to make sure that the US is able to develop these kinds of capabilities. But we can't do this without NSF or NOAA, NASA, uh, ONR, other big agencies which are investing in the same types of problems but with a different angle. And there are other agencies, so DHS, EPA, USGS, uh, HHS. Everybody has a stake in the Arctic in some way. But we can't do this as one agency alone. The problems are too big. So we have to look at this more as a, an interagency effort where we play our role, but we rely upon the investments of other agencies to do the right thing. I think I'll just stop there. So we've heard an emerging research area from, from Rosemary of, of increasing our use of the data that's already there in the context of human health impacts. And Gary's also interested in the use of data for predictions and as we um, attempt to model things and some things that we've talked about in our planning phone calls are, are the need to, how do we use both kinds of knowledge that have been the focus of this conference? How do we use indigenous knowledge and how do we use scientific knowledge to begin to address those emerging research questions? And Hayo is someone who's worked for many years as a Western scientist with a commitment to long-term Arctic observing but also a very strong commitment to collaborating with hunters and another Nupiak sea ice experts from Alaska's North Slope. So in that capacity, um, I'm going to ask you, how should our observations, our sustained Arctic observations, be organized going forward to take account of the benefits that the Arctic provides to the global society and Earth system, so sort of stepping back to that bigger scale, while also considering the benefits and the challenges that Rosemary is talking about um, that climate change presents to Arctic communities? Big question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to flail at answering that. Um, <laughs> I, but but I, I mean, reflecting on, on the past few days, you know, we, we I, I think, I, I tend to be a bit more of an optimist in terms of looking at what we've heard from different people in the room here on the stage, and, and that is to, to reflect that we have a lot, many, maybe all of the tools we need to solve some of the big problems that people have identified, including Rosemary and others on the stage. What we don't have is we, we don't have yet a way to put those tools to good use in combination. That's, that's, that's ultimately is the Arctic problem, and it's a big problem in the Arctic compared to other regions, you know, you, you could argue, well, water availability in the South, America, uh, South, South, South American West, uh, Southwestern US is, is a big issue. You know, people have, have tried solving that. The, the challenge with the Arctic is that the scope 
of, of the broader problem is larger than any of these other regional problems that people are trying to solve. And, and, and that's been well demonstrated by, by people who, who live in the Arctic and have reflected over the course of few, the past few days as to what are some of the challenges, what, what are some of the opportunities. So in many respects, and I think Arctic observing is a great example where there's some progress been made you know, in terms of getting the research community and potential users of information, people in, in Nusrat and, and other places, to jointly agree on what, we, we can't do everything, right? So you have to prioritize. How do you identify those priorities? That's where you have to look at what, what are the benefits at the community level, but, but with the Arctic, global benefits always play a role as well, right? I mean, the Arctic is, is, a, is, is an indigenous space, but it's an indigenous space in many respects in, in an international context. So for a country like China to say, well, we're a near Arctic country, which, you know, from, from a, you know, you're the law expert, from your perspective, you might say, well, that's baloney. But it isn't baloney if you understand how the Arctic connects to mid and lower latitudes, you know, and, and how some of the interests of these countries affect uh, life in a community like Nuxet and other places that we've heard about. So, so, so the, the key challenge is, how, how do we do that? And, and um, George Kling earlier, um, uh, challenge me a bit to say, well, you know, we, 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 we got to be more specific. So, so let's, let's talk specifics. If, if we look at the signs of, of 2050 and this issue of how do we put these different tools together, you could argue that, so it isn't an engineering problem anymore. You know, it isn't a problem of a particular discipline. And, and we can draw a lot of inspiration from indigenous traditional knowledge holders of a more holistic perspective on a broader set of problems. Learning that is tough. You know, I, I, I learn it in part with, with people like, like you, Rosemary, because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the project Amy Lovecraft led, uh, uh, Northern Alaska Scenarios Project. You, you played a very important role in that. I, and that. That was a participatory scenarios project. Again, if, if you're interested in, part, in, in scenarios, I, I would urge you to learn more about it. They're a very effective way of, of you know, social learning and, and turning research into action. I learned a lot because I went in there and thought, hey, you know, if you look at the Arctic, it's all about climate change and climate problems. And, and I came out and, and realized, no. I mean, climate was one of about 15 major drivers. And, and people like Rosemary emphasized, hey, it's health. It's, it's a lot of other, other issues at the community level that matter. So, so, so getting to the point, or one of the points, I, I would argue that by 2050, we have to have figured out how to build communities of practice that link informally or formally different groups of experts who are passionate about a subject. You've heard it from, from our two representatives of, of the congressional delegation. You know, they alluded to the fact that you can't, you know, yes, I mean, you can get stuff done in Congress, but ultimately, even in Congress, it's informal collaboration, communities of practice that help you get stuff done. The challenge is those communities of practice don't just grow on trees. And, and so the, the, the final point I would make is I, I, I would argue that, you know, the, and, and it, it almost gives me a perverse pleasure to say this with Gary on the panel, who represents sort of the, the national lab approach, which is, hey, let's, let's have physics, nuclear physics, define the problem and go from there. I, I would argue by mid-century, we have to have social scientists, indigenous experts, and others at the local level define the problems for us, but also help us use the best that social science, you know, interpersonal communication, uh, you know, the, the issue about the heart that came up earlier has to offer so that we, we, we know how to actually bring all of these tools together. Thank you. And, and that notion of the communities of practice, I think, ties in very much to the previous panel where we were encouraged to think about what is possible. And I think we can think better about what's possible given existing silos when we develop those communities. And I will return to that question of how we do that in very concrete ways. But I do want to get more concrete and specific. And I'll do that by summarizing an eight-minute YouTube TEDx talk that Minnick provides. We're not going to have time for it. So as I said, he's a geologist and a Greenlander and um, studies what we can learn about climate from the Earth's history. But he's also very forward-thinking in how do we bring good news 
from the Arctic about not that climate change is a good thing, but how do we take the results of that? And a very concrete proposition he has for emerging research is think of, and it gets to another issue that we've raised here of social equity, global equity. And his um, observation is that poverty follows poor soil where there are not nutrients, generally speaking. And as the Greenland ice cap retreats, it is leaving exposed incredibly rich mineral deposits that he believes can be effectively transported to um, mid-latitudes, lower latitudes, or the, the middle of the globe where there is heat and a lack of nutrients for good nutrition. And he says, so what would the climate costs of that be? He said, we can, in Greenland, we can mine and export that without chemicals, without adverse um, environmental effects, and it would have the benefit and would counteract any climate costs of transporting those nutritional minerals for use in less rich soil areas it would be offset because once you get the materials to where they're needed, they will themselves help sequester carbon. Right? This is his theory. This is what he proposes in the TEDx talk. And it's a very concrete example of, how we, of, a, of a research question that needs to be pursued further. It gets to what Hayo is talking about in terms of um, benefits that the Arctic can provide to the rest of the world. Um, and so that's just one that I'll put out there for consideration. But I do want to return to something that Melanie said at the very start of the conference and to return to you, Rosemary. She said the urgent questions are not being researched enough. So I'd ask you to identify an urgent question and talk about ways you think we might better support that research. So for me, um, I worry about what's happening in my area with the Arctic and the emissions related to the oil and gas. And so uh, for me, I have tremendous concerns because of the inversions and the failure to restrict flaring during those inversions. So I would like to see this important process connecting what's happening on our grounds and waters with the energy policy, this national energy policy is allowing more and more oil and gas development surrounding my village. And yet it's not connecting that we have inversions when we're flaring this gas, the concentrations increase and many of our people are having respiratory illnesses. So if we can break through some of these barriers that are obstructing that, that's an important for, for me. For our state, it's really important that our animals continue to come into our areas to allow our people to feed our families in the generations to come. And the, there's many other changes that are happening with this global climate change. But in our generations, elders have talked about seven ice ages. So we're in one of many. So, and when you put that into perspectives, you all talk about climate change, we talk about it climate change this year. And so bringing those kind of discussions into this process is very important because we failed to fully understand what has been happening and now we're suffering these tremendous consequences all over the globe with the connection to the Arctic and the changes that are happening. Something you wanted to add to that? I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to... I think you're right. I think we need to have those types of assessments and document exactly what the risks are in detail. And I think once we have that, we could, we could take that forward and see what we can do. I guess the question is, um, yes, documenting is a step. Um, and as we think about, though, the emerging research again, I think we need to also discuss emerging tools or tools that make the emerging research more effective, and I think back to the, the presentation this morning on the new marine protected area, where the mapping of the two different kinds of understanding of the territory, and I'm wondering if, Hayo, in your observing work, which is very, um, observing can be from satellite down to on the ground, and what you see as 
a possible tool to be developed um, or how we can take these different approaches to address the same question, whether it's pollutants or health effects of pollutants. Well, let, uh, let's take the, the specific point you, you raised, um, Rosemary. There's a lot of progress in terms of, of satellite remote sensing um, recently, both in terms of what you can do from satellites as well as uh, you know, unmanned aerial systems. What, what, what's needed is a better link between those groups that design these sensors, deploy instruments, and, and users on the ground in terms of having access to the data, getting, being able to, to extract information from it that's relevant, and that's, again, going to require new types of partnerships. I mean, just as an example, I was, I was in Japan um, uh, a month ago. The Japanese space agency actually operates a satellite that currently is, is one. It's in collaboration with other countries, but Japan is the only country that has a continuous record of CO2, space-based CO2 and methane emissions. It's GOSAT-2 now that they're discussing to launch new. But that's a satellite that does capture methane emissions over larger areas. So it's those types of, of opportunities, linking them to concerns on the ground. How do you how do you do that? You know, how do you actually get to the scale of the community? That's where where I would argue, we and now I'm I'm talking specifically to to my colleagues in academia, maybe in particular at those at University of Alaska. You know, we have to be finding ways that we can involve students more and and researchers within the universities to work with people on the ground in terms of problem-focused instruction, problem-focused discourse, problem-focused knowledge co-production or knowledge generation. So, so figuring out ways that we do that better. And uh, th there's, there's an interest in this, you know, but, but somehow we're still lacking the tools. There's, there's a researcher, um, I, I forget her name right now, I, I gotta look it up, who's actually looked at, and you, you might know her work, at emissions, you know, the gas compositions of, of emissions from the North Slope. It, it's involving people like her and others who, who have the ability to weave these concerns into various parts of instruction and, and research projects. And, and, and there's tools out there. I mean, some of them work, work or, or, or are available. You know, one example I, I, I'd like to give is, you know, NSF National Science Foundation a few years back implemented the broader impacts component of proposals. In theory, that's supposed to be, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, account for about half of what these proposals are evaluated at, but those who know the reality, that's rarely the case because we're researchers, including myself, are not very good at evaluating broader impacts. And I, as both as a reviewer and I'm, I'm ashamed to say as somebody who, who submitted proposals, have seen a lot of weak broader impacts <laughs> sections, right? Those are the types of things that need to be developed further to make use of that. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I would throw the ball back to um, government agencies, and I think DOE has been great in terms of recognizing that if, if you're talking about energy, it's not just about energy production or fossil fuel or what have you, it's about the impact. Um, so DOE has looked at how do you you know, how do you look at this holistically? That's where the Earth system modeling initiatives come in. But you have other agencies, you know, you look at NASA. NASA has an applied sciences program, but it's very, very small. I, I don't know what their budget is, but, but it, I, I suspect it's about, uh, for, for, for the globe, it's about a tenth of what Gary's program spends in just one part of the Arctic. So developing those types of programs further and getting researchers and students and, and people in communities, the ability to tap into those types of funds is going to be really important. So I, I see both Rosemary and Gary want to say something, but I want to start pulling in the audience questions, and, and they're very much along the lines of what you've been talking about. And I'm going to read three of them that I think relate very much to how do we um, fill gaps, how do we bring in indigenous knowledge, how do we better co-produce knowledge for better prediction. So one is... Um, Gary, you mentioned how DOE works to make the prediction models more robust with less uncertainty. What sources of information and decision process do you use to decide what the models actually predict? Hmm. To Rosemary, the question is, the displacement of hunters from former subsistence areas within the oil fields east of Nooksuk is one of the biggest impacts of oil and gas on the slope. How do you fix that? And then uh, so, uh, another question, um, that I think ties this together well is science and indigenous knowledge should inform policy and investment. 
can the lived indigenous experience fill confidence gaps created by scientific uncertainty, both in the modeling and in the investment context? So those three, I think, tie together well. I'll let you guys decide who goes first. Okay, I'll, I think I remember the first question. Anyway, I just wanted to, to say that the scientific community historically has not been very good about engaging, let's say, stakeholders in helping to define the problem from the beginning. They often define a problem based upon what they see as a science gap. They write a proposal to a funding agency. It's reviewed by scientific colleagues who also don't typically have connections to stakeholders. The stakeholders historically I'm, I'm going to say, just in general, have been left out. And we've recognized that that's a major shortcoming. In fact, I, I give credit to the American Geophysical Union, because they tried to push the concept of getting stakeholders much more engaged in the process from the beginning so that they would own the process from the start, and it would be just the scientists. Um, so this is something with the AG, with, that the AG has at least been trying to do for the past at least five years. Now, it doesn't mean that all of the scientists within the community who are writing proposals do it. But I can say that we did do something earlier this year in Iowa as part of this new project we just started for the North Slope of a modeling project for the North, North Slope of Alaska, and that is that we wouldn't try to develop a, a predictive capability for the scientists alone to study or analyze, but it would be driven by what we felt stakeholders needed in terms of their future investment or shortcomings and decisions which they need to make. Some of those are coastal erosion. Some of those are coastal hydrology. What types of uh, hypoxia events in southern Alaska could eventually migrate around to the north? But these are the kinds of things that we felt that we could at least make a start to do. But it doesn't mean we're doing a great job. We're just making a start. And I think a discussion like this could help motivate a broader community, scientific community uh, adjustment to take on a new paradigm of how they define problems. So returning caribou to the east of Nooksit is a very important discussion. We've had a lot of discussions in our community about that. Um, one big issue is that the infrastructure has not been um, Rehab rehabilitated. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done in certain areas, but if we did a better job of restoring the area after they're done with their resource extraction, then we might have hopes of having caribou come back into these areas. But if we were stepping back even further and fully understanding how do our animals get into these areas and how their migratory paths are so very important and what are we doing around these areas that are impacting whether or not our animals get into these areas are very important. It, we can look at some of these satellite mappings and if we broke it down into some of these unit developments, then you could look at periods of time prior to activity in this area, look at it during activity in this area, how did it impact how the caribou's moves, are there design changes that we could put, like we forced the raising of the pipeline up off the tundra to allow caribou's to get through, because I have pictures and some of my work that show the pipelines on the ground, and I teach our kids that we have to be engaged in these meetings because we have to tell them how it should be de designed not how it can be done, designed most profitably, because it is for our continued life in the village that we want to make sure that animals continue to come to us. But we also have to look at some of these very important areas, such as the calving grounds, and how we have three herds that are in serious decline, and how there are protections on the Canadian side, and the porcupine herd that goes to that calving ground and comes back into the U.S. side, that side is still a highly productive herd. But the other three herds where their calving grounds are now in the industrial field, they are very impacted. Or in the West, where you have increased concentration of the fly-in hunters and the changes that are happening on that side. All of these important discussions need to be brought out of their various silos. You have a little bit of discussion on subsistence. You have a little bit of discussion on energy. You have a little bit of discussion on Department of Transportation. 
but it's about the human health of our people and bringing these discussions out of their silos so that we prevent, prevent the serious impacts that happen with loss of caribou, the social ills. When you have no caribou to eat, I saw what happens in our village when all of a sudden seismic activity drove the caribou completely away from our village. When we had no whales to eat, when we had seismic activity during whaling, those were winters I never want to see repeated, and I'm a very aggressive in this process to educate others that we should not force these severe changes on our peoples because we all are important people in these discussions. So. I think Rosemary um, raises with those comments another very important issue as an historian also thinking about <coughs> we have past data, we have past experience of food scarcity, for example, that we can learn from and how good a job are both the indigenous knowledge and the research communities doing at rescuing data. That's something our organization also tries to support is there, we can learn from these past lessons um, and how can we apply existing data to, to those um, emerging questions. An anonymous question comes in that gets us back though to the theme of time scale. Climate change has a large influence on the Arctic, but how do you address future issues when there are current issues that are not being addressed quickly enough in a rapidly changing environment. And here I'll just throw in, a, so the cold pool, if you think about that narrow space in the Bering Strait where we've had ice until very recently that makes that wall of cold water serve as a very natural barrier to stocks moving either direction. Oceanography community said five years ago, oh, by 2050, it'll be gone by 2050. It was gone last year, and it looks like it will be gone again this year. And I'm sure each of you have examples of that. But I'd like to hear, yes, we need to address future issues. Um, and I think those maybe have been dismissed because they're not as pressing. But how do we do this balance as we think about the emerging research questions? Which ones do you address? Is it chicken and egg? And I... For me, it's bringing the discussion to the communities where the research is going to be done and letting the communities work in the process of identifying what are our community priorities and working with others who want to do research on these very important issues to help answer some of our questions, but also help to build the answers to the questions that others have on these important issues. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a tough question. The panel is about the future, but, but you know, whoever asked the question is right. I mean, you know, the future is here. Um, it, it's, I, I think the key thing is that we, we, we clearly, or, or you, you, could, you could argue that we lack capacity, right? Both um, within, I mean, that's what, what I took away from a lot of panels um, over, over the course of a couple of days from, from people who, who live in the Arctic. But in some ways it's true for the research community as well. We, we lack capacity right now to respond effectively to some of the challenges we're seeing. And so how do you, how do you build that? I, I think that's a key question. You, in my mind, again, you, looking at our educational system, higher education, informal education is absolutely critical because regardless, I mean, you, you've, you've, you've heard it from, you know, the younger people here, the younger generation, I mean, they're, they're, they're informed in many ways. They, they know better. I mean, let, let's, again, let's talk specifics, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm with this generation where I spend probably two years of my education at university learning stuff that is absolutely useless. You know, I never, I, I actually probably never used it while I was in, in, in the midst of scientific research. I don't need it now. And part of the reason is we have a lot of knowledge that is accessible through online sources. I mean, the way we deal, we, we freed up, in essence, a lot of stupid study time um, to do things that are relevant, right? And so let's, let's put that to better, better use. I, I would argue the younger generation is much more adept at using these different types of tools and not 
getting bogged down by learning names of minerals, you know, which was part of what I spent those two years on. So, um, uh, and anyways, there's only ice, right, that you really have to remember. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, but that's, but, but putting, it, it, but at the same time, you know, we, we do see, so, so Hey, I'm, I'm from the University of Alaska. Those of you who follow the media know that we, we, we're facing a significant challenge, but I would argue that's a great opportunity as well. We're, we're America's Arctic University. I, I, I would argue that some of the faculty members that are in the room here and others know how to work and address these types of problems, but again, how, how do you build capacity? It's an opportunity to, to transform part of the educational system in terms of what needs to be done to, to be, get better at co-production of knowledge, get better at bringing the social sciences, uh, liberal arts, other, other forms of solving problems into the engineering or the physical or in the environmental sciences. The health sciences is a great example where, where that may already be happening now. And so in terms of effective response, it, it's, it's not gonna be a bunch of people like myself sitting on a stage you know, pontificating, it's, it's going to be at, at the level where you have students from some of these communities. I mean, Denali is a great example, right? I mean, or you have people like Corey Erickson here in, in, in the front row. I mean, th these are folks who are, who are able to actually do something, but they also know where to, where to sort of look within academia or within federal agencies for some of the help. I guess my turn. But I, I thought I'd just make a few comments getting back to the question of balance between long-term climate change research and more immediate uh, questions. So if we think about science policy in general, how it's developed, the, the, there's the uh, multi-generational question of climate change. And people worry about that because of long-term investments which transition multiple generations. And if we're, tr if we're passing off the solution to a subsequent generation, that's a commitment that the policy process has to deal with. And that's the, I would say that's a, a big basis for our investments in uh, climate research. But the other piece is uh, if, we're, if you're developing a strategy within a federal agency or writing a narrative for a, a budget, let's say an FY21 budget request, you focus on what are the big surprises, uh, what are the national security risks of a surprise, and was, is there a sense of urgency of a scientific problem that wasn't there, say, two or three years ago? Something which, and that gets a lot. It's, it's a different angle from an intergenerational problem of climate change, but it's still environmental science or geophysical science in some way, but they're, but they're coming at it from two different angles. So I'm not going to say one is more important or less important than the other. They're both of equal value. It's just that the arguments that are made to support why this or why not that, they can still satisfy having a short-term uh, challenge to look at, say, the bearing uh, ice versus long-term climate change that might play out in the future. They can be argued both ways. Congress and the president's budget request, consider both of them, and they have to. But I would say the most important thing for the scientific community and get people's interest, uh, the federal agencies, especially program managers, is it new, is it, uh, is it urgent, and will it have big impacts? And all of these kind of touch that. So we are um, out of time, I would, close by pitching some questions to the next panel, which is also looking at emerging research, but they're talking more on capacity and scale. And through some of the questions here get to, um, what about, so we've talked a little bit about investment in the Arctic here, and I just want to step back for a moment and recall a theme that I've heard throughout that I think does get to capacity. What is our capacity, each of us, to think differently about how we understand the Arctic, how we understand investment, how we understand economy. And the Nunavut example was so powerful, the ability of community-driven uh, economy, shaping the economy they want. And I think of George's very beautiful 
comments yesterday about sharing um, cooperation and collaboration as a way of caring for each other. And I think that can be done between the different communities. And the way that I have begun to think about that in a conversation with Rachel and others, over and over again, our indigenous colleagues say, we are part of the ecosystem. We are part of the ecosystem. And I'm wondering what our economies would look like, what our research would look like, if those of us who are not indigenous would also begin to understand that we are part of the ecosystem. And maybe that way we could begin to reshape how we think about emerging research questions. So I will leave it with that and ask you to thank our panelists for their very helpful reflections. Thank you.